All right, cool. Hey, I think you guys can all hear me. You can see me, all that stuff. Hey, first of all, just want to apologize. My voice sounds like that secretary from Monsters, Inc. right now because I just had the flu. My baby has the flu. My wife has the flu. My sister and nieces, everybody in my whole life has the flu right now. So uh, I'm actually I'm actually feeling pretty good, but my voice is just trashed because, you know, you know how the flu is. It's weird is I don't feel like I've ever gotten a flu before, so I don't know what, what's up with that. But anyway, so we're just making do with what we got. <clears throat> but I'm super excited to get to join you guys, and I chose to come and sit down here on my couch today because just tired. <laughs> just tired of uh, not having any energy for the week. So next week, we'll see what happens. But I am super pumped, super excited that you guys are here today. Uh, you are just the best people ever, the best online church people. I, I'm so stoked that I get to share this time with you guys every single week. If you don't know who we are, we are The Dwelling Place. We are a startup church that's beginning in, beginning here in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, and we are looking forward to starting in-person services come hopefully this January. And uh, they're going to be on Saturday nights at first until we can grow and kind of expand to a Sunday morning service. But so be looking out for updates for that. If you're in Anchorage, you are so invited to come. We want you guys there. Spread the word. Let people know. It's going to be a good time. And uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed my my friend uh, Jason last week. He's an excellent guy. I love getting to talk to him, share, do life with him. He's all the way down in Florida. I'm up here in Alaska. We're about as far away as you can get from each other. But uh, one cool thing about being in ministry with your friends is that Distance doesn't really matter that much, you know, because we still get to pray together, talk, live. To, I mean, it's it's a great time. So I'm super thankful that Jason uh, shared the word with us. And I hope you guys got something out of it because I really loved his message. And then on top of that, uh, we're starting our new sermon series today. So I was spending time like thinking about series that I wanted to do, how I wanted to go forward with it and stuff. And. Uh, then I just asked my wife, Savannah, and I was like, hey, babe, what what do you think I should do a series on? And she says, well, you already talked about Jonah. Why don't you just go through all the major Bible stories that we were taught as kids? And I said, hey, like where your head is at, I'm pretty much a kid myself. Let's do it. So we, over the next several weeks, uh, maybe six to seven weeks, we're going to be talking about the major Bible stories that we always heard growing up. But now that we're older, now that we have like contextual understanding of the Bible, maybe the lessons that we learned as a kid is not the actual purpose of the story in itself today. And so that's something that we want to explore and just talk about and have a fun time doing it. And so today is probably, I don't know, one of the, of course, it's one of the top Bible stories that you learn in Sunday school, which is Daniel and the lion's den. <coughs> Sorry for coughing, guys. But yeah, we're going to be talking about Daniel and the lion's den today. So if you would, go ahead and open up to Daniel chapter 6. We're going to Daniel chapter 6 today. All right, give you guys a second to go. And uh, while you're turning, I'm going to go ahead and open this up with a word of prayer. And we'll get started. So, Father, in Jesus' name, God, thank you so much for uh, everything that you've done for us, everything that you are, God. Thank you for um, your own character and nature, the way that you love us. And, God, I pray that you continue to help us grow in love with you, grow more in love with the other people around us, grow in more uh, love and passion to reach the lost, God. And I pray for your Holy Spirit to be all over this service today, that your words be my words, that your thoughts be my thoughts, that everything we do think and say today and teach and learn uh, all glorifies you, Jesus, to the fullest extent. We want everything to point back to you, God. You are so magnificent. You are so beautiful. And we love you and we praise you. And if this doesn't glorify you, God, I don't want any part of it. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, cool. My hair's at that stage now, like, if I put on my hat, 
and I don't tuck my hair behind my ears. It just like sticks out like Bozo the Clown really bad. So now I just kind of look like a 70s baseball player or something. I don't know. But anyway, <clears throat> I hope you guys turn to Daniel chapter 6. Now, what we're going to do is, you guys know how I like to do these things. I really want to give you guys an understanding of where Daniel is coming from when we get to Daniel chapter 6, okay? So, Daniel grew up in Jerusalem, of course. But what ended up happening is that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came in and destroyed Jerusalem. He overtook Jerusalem. The Lord allowed this to happen. And now Jerusalem is under the rule, reign, and authority of a pagan a pagan king in a pagan country, right, of Babylon. And so the king was like, hey, you know what, let's get a couple of these, like, uh, kids here. Uh, I want them to be strong without blemish. I want them to be smart, able to learn. And we're going to bring them into the castle. We're going to let them eat the king's food. We're going to let them drink the king's drinks. We're going to teach them our language and our ways. And they're kind of going to be uh, kind of like a a tether between Jerusalem and Babylon so that like communications and things can happen right and so you guys most likely know three of these dudes they go by the names Shadrach Meshach and Abednego however that is not their actual name um their real names here just to read them off in Daniel chapter one is uh Hananiah Mishael and Azariah and then the fourth guy was Daniel. And they changed Daniel's name as well uh, to Belteshazzar. Let me uh, just double check where, uh, where we're at. One second here. Yeah, Belteshazzar. You see that in Daniel 4, chapter 19. Sorry. Daniel 4, verse 19. My head's still a little scrambled, guys. I'm sorry. But so anyway, these four people came in. Now, these are Jewish people, or like... Hebrew people, right? So they were dedicated and devoted to Yahweh, but now they're living under a pagan country, and not just living under a pagan country, but living under the pagan country's pagan ruler, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar fancied himself a god, right? He considered himself the god. Like, if, if we were to describe him with kids' lingos today, He'd be the goat, right? I'm talking like with my brother-in-law, Ray's language, Cody's language, trying to relate to you guys right now, okay? Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the goat. He was not the goat. He was just a king. Um, and for all you old people like me, goat stands for greatest of all time. Okay. But anyway, so they were living in this place, and they're trying to get them to eat things that these Israelite people aren't supposed to be eating. They're, they're, they're serving them pork. They're serving them shellfish. They're serving them uh, these different wines. And, and they're having them live a pagan lifestyle that was contrary to what God has asked them to do. Well, um, we're not talking about this story so much, but as uh, I, I just kind of want to share these little things with you to let you understand Daniel's character, right? So Daniel was obviously not comfortable with living a lifestyle that was contrary to what God has asked him to do. So instead he said, hey, instead of me eating all of these foods of the king and defiling myself, please just allow me to eat fruits and vegetables, right? So long story short, they allowed uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to eat uh, fruits and vegetables. They ended up being blessed by that by God and were stronger and more fit and stuff than everybody else who's been eating the king's food, right? And then you run into this situation where uh, the three the three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were thrown into the fiery furnace. That's something we're also going to talk about a little bit today. We'll probably talk about it a little bit more on our podcast um, <clears throat> on Wednesday. But then uh, Daniel continued to grow up uh, under the king's ruling, but never giving up his faith and his hope and his drive to serve God. Uh, and there's been a couple of times where the king has has declared, hey, you need to worship this God, you need to do this, you need to do that. And these four people continued to not 
obey the rules of the authority around them when it uh, insisted that they go against the law of God, right? So they were adamant that they were going to serve God despite what the surrounding around them was telling them to do. Well, Daniel ended up continuing to grow and prosper under this authority. Uh, um, and at this point, we're going to go to here to uh, Daniel chapter 6. This is what it says. It says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to give these satraps, satraps should give account. So there's 120 of these satraps that were under over the whole country. And this was as a way for the king to not be overburdened with every little thing in the entire uh, Babylon region, right? This was a huge area. And so over these 120 satraps, there were three satraps who were over everybody else. And among these three, one of them was Daniel. So Daniel's character uh, that he grew up, he was continuing to be blessed by God and continue to rise in the ranks of um, of the authority there, the kingdom of Babylon. And so it says, so that the king might suffer no loss. And then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. So when we now are think about Daniel, what should come to your mind is that this guy was faithful. This guy was excellent. He was above reproach. It's not to say that he was perfect by any means, but Daniel was an amazing uh, person of the Bible, person of this time that was so excellent that he became over all of these satraps, over all of the officials. He became the one that stood out and was distinguished. And you know what? I really want you guys to think about this because we learned the context of what's happening and what seems to be going really well for Daniel doesn't mean that this is what Daniel wanted to do with his life. I guarantee that Daniel didn't wake up one day as a teenager and say, hey, you know what? I want to be a distinguished satrap among the Babylonian pagan empire and I want to stand out to a king who thinks that he's a god, right? Daniel didn't want to be in Babylon. Daniel didn't ask for these promotions. Daniel didn't want his name to be taken away from him and to be replaced with a name that didn't belong to him. Now, to put this into modern times so you guys can understand the significance about it, think about what happened to many of the Alaskan natives here a hundred years ago when missionaries came in, decided they couldn't pronounce the names of the Alaska uh, natives, any back people up in Kotzebue, and decided to line them up and give them English American names, civilized names, right? It, it never should have been done. That wasn't a cool thing to do at all. And what it did was it's an attempt to take away an important part of their identity, right? Now, Daniel knew that his identity wasn't his name, but still, to be called a name other than what was given to you by your mom and dad, um, not willingly, but taken from you, uh, that's, that's like, I feel like one of the lowest things you can do, right? To say, hey, your name's not good enough, I'm going to give you a different one, because, uh, you know, I just don't like yours. Now, we do see that God has taken names and changed names throughout the Bible, but his is a form of promotion, a form of extending love towards these people. Uh, God is really the only person who can do this and does it justly and rightfully. That's actually an honor, right? So that's what it's like for Daniel right now. He's living in a country that honestly has no respect for him or his people, uh, no respect for his customs or his motives or anything, but God continues to bless Daniel. And not only does God continue to bless Daniel, but God's name actually becomes more and more known to the king of Babylon because of Daniel and also because of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
God is becoming known in this city, and he's becoming known so much that the king uh, starts to kind of respect our God, Yahweh. I'm going to get a drink real quick, guys. It's coffee, which is a dehydrator. I probably shouldn't have it for my throat, but whatever. So that's where Daniel's at, okay? Now, let's continue to see what's going on. So it said, the high officials and the satraps fought, sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Again, this is just showcasing Daniel's um, excellency. His, his faithfulness to Jesus was so, or to God was so faithful that the satraps couldn't find anything wrong with him. <coughs> they couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel. But they did know that there was one area where they could look, where they could trigger him, where they could, they could get him um, in trouble. And the men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the, with the law of his God. So what they're saying is, hey, we're not going to catch Daniel in sin. We're not going to catch Daniel stealing from the king. He's not going to be skimming off the top. He's not going to be dishonest or lying. Daniel is Daniel, and he's just not going to do anything that's going to remove him from this office. But the one thing they knew about Daniel for sure is that, the, is that he was fully and 100% devoted to God. And it didn't matter what came in his way in his life. He was going to follow God first, regardless, no matter what. He was fully devoted to God, Yahweh. And so they said, if there's anywhere we can get Daniel, it's going to be when it comes to him and God. So this is what they did. These high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high king officials, or all the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction. First of all, no, not all of the prefects and satraps and counselors agree on this because Daniel obviously would have agreed to this, right? But so they themselves are lying to the king. <clears throat> and so they say, we should make an injunction or a mandate that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So what they're saying is if anybody prays to anybody else other than you, king, they need to be killed, right? There's no other reason to be thrown into a den of lions other than to be killed. So when this letter, when this mandate went out to all of the region, they knew exactly uh, what was being said to them. Do not pray to anybody else. Only pray to the king. If you do, you're going to die. That's it. Very simple mandate. And it's going to last for 30 days. <clears throat> so uh, the king, uh, to establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Now, uh, this isn't like the most important thing here. But one thing that I want you guys to just kind of remember is that uh, at this time, this is not Nebuchadnezzar anymore. The king has moved on. We're into a new king. Now, as I said earlier, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the goat, right? The greatest of all time. He would not have signed something that he could not unsign. Why? Because he thought that he himself was the God. He was the man. There was nothing he couldn't do. Nothing that he wouldn't do. He could do whatever he want, however he wanted. Now, this new king that we're calling Darius at the time <clears throat> uh, has a little bit of a lesser authority than Nebuchadnezzar had. And so they believed that Darius was led by the gods. He wasn't necessarily a god himself, but he was led by the gods. So anything that Darius signs into play, he can't unsign 
because you can't undo something that the gods have done, right? Only the gods themselves can do that. And so as soon as Darius signs this, uh, signs this document, signs this injunction, it has to carry through. That's what's going on at this time. That's why they said, sign this paper so that you cannot undo it. <clears throat> and so therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. And now this is going to be trouble for Daniel, right? Because what is he going to do? Is Daniel going to give up and risk his life to continue serving God? Or is Daniel going to obey this mandate of the country and follow the rules and authority of his nation uh, and save his life, right? But then sacrifice a relationship with God. And so it's a very important decision for Daniel. And it says here that when Daniel knew that the document has been signed, guess what? He went to his house where he had his windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. And he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. And listen to this. It says, as he had done previously. <clears throat> this authority came in. This mandate came in to bow to no one, to pray to no one, to plead to no one except King Darius or else you will die. And Daniel heard this. He understood this. He knew exactly what it meant. And he went to his room and prayed and gave thanks to God like he always did. He didn't allow this mandate, this injunction to shape his relationship with God, to change his relationship with God. He knew, just like with me and you, when we came to Christ, we died to Christ. We died to ourselves and we came alive in Jesus. That means our life is no longer our own. Well, Daniel didn't know Jesus at the time, but he knew God. He understood the power of God. He saw what God had already done to his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He saw the power of God. He saw how God continued to raise him in stature in a pagan king despite following God and not following the pagan laws and rituals, right? So when this signed into agreement, when this was signed into action and it could not be taken away, Daniel said, God is more than any injunction. God is more than any mandate. And I refuse to let these things stop me from having a relationship with my God. And guys, that's one thing that nothing can take away from you. Nothing can take away your relationship with God. They can try to scare you. They can try to force things onto you. They can list all the mandates in the world. They can do all of these things. But at the end of the day, you can worship God. You can love God. You can serve God. That's not to say that it might not put you at risk, it might not put you at danger, it might not cancel you. But nobody can take away your ability, to, your ability to serve and to love God. They just can't do it. So <clears throat> Daniel was like, wow, they're going to kill me if I pray to God? They better go pray about this, right? So that's what he did. And so these men, these satraps who sought out to capture him, to... to get him in trouble, right? These men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and pleading before his God. So they found him praying. And so they came near and said before the king concerning this injunction, they said, oh, king, as if they really respect him, right? Oh, king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any good, I mean, to any God or man within 30 days, except to you, oh, king, shall be cast into the den of lions? They're they're just totally they're just totally playing him right now, dude. They they're totally setting him up, trapping him right now. And so the king was like, "Yeah, the thing stands fast, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which can't be revoked." So they answered the king and said to him, "Well, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you signed, but makes his petition three times a day." 
<clears throat> so here's the deal. The king was upset about this, but he wasn't upset at Daniel. He was upset at the situation that he couldn't change. It says that the king went when he heard these words, he was in much distress and he set his mind to deliver Daniel. He didn't want Daniel to die. So he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. But these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, No, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. So the king was kind of had his hands tied. He either tried to save Daniel's life and have them both be killed, or he follows through with his kingship, his order that he laid out, and he throws Daniel into the lion's den despite how he feels about him. Now, Daniel made his choice. Daniel knew that he could die, and he knew that it would be worth it anyway if he did die. And so Daniel made his choice, and, Neb and uh, Darius here made his choice. So the king commanded Daniel uh, to be brought and cast into the den of lions. And the king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. Darius knew that there was something about the God of Daniel. Because Daniel stood out. He was excellent. He was above reproach. He, his character was impeccable. He was a great guy. And the Lord continued to bless him and help him grow and succeed in what he was doing. So when Daniel was thrown in, the only thing that Darius could do was pray that God would save his friend, would save this satrap that he has come to love, right? To enjoy this guy. So he says, may your God save you. The God you can turn and continually serve. Let him deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. So what happens here is this is extremely similar to Jesus' tomb, right? Jesus was put into this tomb and a big stone rolled in front of it, and it says that it was sealed. Now, when I was a kid, when I heard the word sealed, what I thought was that the stone was locked into place, right? That somehow they they put concrete around the edges or something and that you couldn't move the stone away. But what it being sealed actually means is that the king takes his signet ring and he dips it in wax or whatever he does and he presses it onto the stone. And when he presses it onto the stone, the king's signet ring is implanted in that stone. The, the symbol of it is anyway. And when people come and see it, they know that by king's decree, by the king's law, if anybody touches or moves this stone, they will be killed. They will be considered a traitor against the, the law of Babylon, against the nation of Babylon. They have gone against the king's desire, and that's not good, right? <laughs> that's not good. And that's what they did with Jesus' tomb, too. When they rolled that stone, they sealed it with the ring of the king, and they said nothing can open or move this stone. It is set in place by king's decree. And so, and so that's where we're at. Daniel thrown into the den of the lions. And Daniel knew, Daniel knew this whole time what could have happened to him. In fact, he knew that they weren't messing around either. Because he already saw his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into, thrown into the fire earlier in this book, right? For very similar reasons. Now, at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, everybody worship this giant statue that I made. And the whole country did, except for these three. And so the king threw them into the furnace as punishment. And I want you guys to think or to listen to what... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to King Nebuchadnezzar, because I want you guys to think about what may have been running through Daniel's mind at the time. 
So this is what it says in uh, Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, this is before they were thrown into the furnish, for, uh, furnace. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, meaning if you throw us in the fire, our God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. So these guys, these these three dudes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, knew the capability of God's uh, power to save them from the fiery furnace, right? They were sure that they could be saved from the flames and taken out unharmed. But this is what they said immediately after. They said, Our God who's able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And they said, And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So there's faith. But then in 18, they say, But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you set up. They're saying, hey, God can save us. We believe that God can save us. We believe that he's strong enough, that he's powerful, that he's good enough, that you can throw us in this fire and we will be saved. But then they also knew that God also could allow them to be eaten by the flames, to be burnt by the flames, to be killed. And it didn't matter to them either way. Because either way, they weren't going to bow down to the gods of Nebuchadnezzar. They weren't going to worship the gods of Nebuchadnezzar. They said, hey, do what you want with us. We might be saved, we might be killed, but regardless, no matter what, we will still serve God over you. You cannot stop our desire to worship our Lord. Do what you want. We are going to follow God. And so Daniel must be thinking back to this time of his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and remembering how God saved them from the burning flames and took them out, took them out of the flames without even the smell of smoke on them. None of their clothes, clothes were singed. None of that even happened. They were just brought out of the flames, good as new. And Nebuchadnezzar saw the power of God that day. And so Daniel, thrown into the lion's den, I can just imagine him thinking, God can save me, but if not, I will not serve your gods. I will not pray to the king. And so the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Isn't this so funny? <coughs> it doesn't say who the king fasted to, who he was praying to. But there's a mandate right now, right? That nobody can worship anybody but the king. And now here's the king fasting and uh, fasting for Daniel. He's, he's obviously worshiping somebody. He's obviously reaching out to some god during the mandate where that wasn't supposed to happen at all, right? I don't know if the king was immune from this mandate, if he could do what he wanted, but I know that he couldn't overturn this mandate. So what was going on right now? But regardless, the king's desire was for Daniel to live and to grow and to thrive. And he did not want Daniel to be thrown into this lion's den. So he's praying and he's seeking and he said, hey, may, may your God save you. And then he goes home and he fasts on behalf of his satrap. He fasts on behalf of his friend for him to live. And then at the break of the day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of the lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, and he cried out in a tone of anguish. And the king declared to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, king, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions. And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and that they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, 
and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. <clears throat> Could you imagine what the king Darius must have been feeling at this moment? He was in anguish over his friend. He was dreading that he ever signed this agreement in the first place because he he didn't know that Daniel would have been thrown into the fiery or to the lion's den. And so he runs there, he cries out to his friend, he says, Daniel, did your God save you? And then out of the darkness of this den, he hears the voice of Daniel saying, O king, live forever. And Darius knew, Darius knew at that moment the blamelessness of Daniel, and he also knew the power of of God Yahweh. He knew that the Yahweh God was stronger than the kings of Babylon. He was stronger than the gods of Babylon. He was stronger than any any pagan god that there was. He was bigger, he was stronger, and he was able to save Daniel. And so the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Now remember that because we're going to we're going to come back to this, okay? <laughs> if I want to finish out the rest of this story before we do. So the king commanded that the men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and they were cast into the den of lions, they and their children and their wives, and before they even reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all of their bones in pieces. So it's not like these tigers weren't hungry. It's not like these, or sorry, lions. It's not like these lions didn't want to eat, right? When they saw Daniel, I'm sure they wanted to eat Daniel, but their mouths were shut by God, and they were able to live in peace with this guy. But then as soon, as soon as they saw these other guys coming into this den, they were destroyed and eaten up entirely, just their bones broken. Them, their wives, their children, their whole families were destroyed by these lions. And I believe that this just kind of showcases, one, the power and veracity that the the lions had that Daniel was in the midst of. But it also shows the punishment of the sin of these guys. The sin of these satraps didn't just affect them, it affected their entire family. Now, it's not like uh, God commanded King Darius to throw his family, their families in there. God didn't command this from the king. The king chose to do this because they have lied to the king, they have sinned against the king, and this is the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is death. And it's not necessarily death in our world today, but outside of the law of uh, the United States, when it comes to the spiritual consequence of sin, it is always, always, always going to be death. And this is kind of a very hardcore illustration of this. Now, let's finish up the rest of this so we can go back to a couple of key places, things, okay? So King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. And this is what he said. He said, peace be multiplied, uh, peace be multiplied to you. I made to make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. So we went from having a 30-day mandate for this entire nation to worship nobody but the king himself to now a permanent mandate that the entire pagan kingdom of Babylon must fear and respect and tremble the God of Daniel, who is the God of Israel, the God that we serve today. And King Darius goes on. And gives this amazing worship to God. He says, he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom 
shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. <clears throat> now, there's three things we're really going to touch on uh, just rather quickly before we wrap up, okay? When we were a kid, when we were kids, what was the lesson that you learned, that you were taught from Daniel? Well, it's it was right here at verse 23. It says, no harm was found on him, Daniel, because he had trusted in his God. And the lesson that we oftentimes pull from this message is that if you trust God, and if you do the right thing, you will be safe. You will not be harmed. Guys, I'm sorry to say that that is not true. It's not true. It is true for Daniel at the time. Daniel was saved. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were saved. They did trust God. And that we have this beautiful, amazing story of God's power in the midst of a pagan authoritarian uh, kingship, right? We see that God stood firm in an area that denounced God's power right? But the message of this is not that we just have to follow God. We just have to obey God and he will protect us from everything. That's not the message of Daniel. Now, don't get me wrong. God may save you from the flames. God may save you from the lion's den. There may be times in your life where you are physically in trouble because of your faith. The chances of that happening here in America is not that much. And God very well might save you from that because God is faithful. God does desire uh, prosperity for us. He does des desire health for us. He does desire good things for us. But just because he desires you to prosper doesn't mean you're going to be rich. We do not live we do not teach the prosperity gospel here, which is that you have to give to God and he's going to give back to you, right? We don't teach that here because it's just not always true. Here's the truth about God. Is that sometimes God is going to allow harm to come to your life, even though you are faithful and just before him and faithful and just where you're at. Guys, think about it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, they were face to face with certain death. They were face to face with a fiery furnace of flames. Guys, have you ever burnt yourself cooking? It hurts. That bad, getting like, just a little, ah, man, you're like a little burn is just like, just like ooh, the most annoying and most like painful little thing. I hate getting burned. I know my wife is laughing right now because I constantly get burned. I don't know what it is. I'm just terrible at like, like not getting burnt. I don't know what it is. And it like hurts so bad every time the littlest, tiniest little burn. And here Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are face to face, not with a little ouch, but with like, just like death, death by burning. And then Daniel is face to face with lions, lions, guys, lions. Have you ever watched The Revenant? I know that had nothing to do with lions, but like, I believe a lion could do just as much damage as a bear could do, especially when you come into multiple lions just tearing you and calling you to bits. Guys, that is scary. And what I want you guys to think here is that God did not save them from being thrown into the flames. And God did not save them from being thrown into the den of lions. The worst thing that could happen happens to them. 
They were put in the midst of danger. And the fiery furnace door was sealed shut. The den of lions was sealed with a giant stone. They could not get out. They were locked into place with the area that they were going to die in. But for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, God saved them from the face of death. And you know why? Because God was glorified both times. Both times God was glorified. The first time, Nebuchadnezzar saw the power and majesty of God. And now here with Daniel, God is glorified in the midst of the entire Babylon pagan nation. To where now these people have to tremble and fear before God. That's why Daniel was saved. Daniel was saved because God was glorified in it. And isn't it beautiful that God was glorified by saving Daniel? But you know what? We have a history of church history of people who have been martyred because of their faith in God. We have a, a history of of people who have been thrown into the Colosseum and killed also by lions. Even right now in our world today, we have brothers and sisters overseas in India who are, who are killed for their faith in God. In Africa, their villages are rampaged because they believe in God. In, in Muslim nations, we have Muslims who turn to God knowing that they might be killed, they might be destroyed by their very own family because they don't worship Allah, they worship Yahweh. And yet they continue to serve and love and worship God because they understand the power and truth of God Yahweh. And so this is my question. This is what I want you guys to think about. Our world today I'm sad to say, is not getting any better. We now have mandates coming into place that can make it harder and harder to serve God fully. The country uh, can start beginning to cap what we can teach in our church services. They can begin to, to uh, make sure that we hire people in our churches that may not align with our church's doctrines and beliefs, right? But but we have to follow these mandates and these orders. And one thing that I think is hard for us to remember, I'm not teaching anarchy here, okay? Far be it from me. God says that we are to obey the rules of the land. But nonetheless, nonetheless, God's law is higher than the law of man. It's higher than the law of the United States. And if the United States tells us that we need to supersede a law of God, that we need to ignore our worship of God because of a law or mandate in our country, or we need to neglect a truth of God to not be canceled, or we need to, to withhold something of the gospel uh, for, for to make sure that everyone feels whatever, right? Not only should we not obey those mandates, not obey those decrees, but we must not. Because we cannot put patriotism above God. We cannot put America above law above God. We cannot put social norms and, and culture and, and my truths and all of these things. We cannot put what is being pushed on us above the truth and the gospel of God. We just can't do it. So my question to you is what would you have done? What would you have done if you were in Daniel's shoes? Guys, t these times could come. I'm not saying that they're going to. I'm not here to, to scare you or to put fear in our hearts. 
But I am telling you that our nation is straying further and further away from the truth and the gospel of God. And it is going to get harder and harder to share the full truth of God. And we will be tempted to withhold truth, to not to not share the full doctrine of sin. Because people don't want to talk about sin because they say that is hateful. But we're not sharing the doctrine of sin with hate. We're sharing it as a way for people to understand their depravity and to push forward to the God who can save them from themselves, that can save them from the chain and bondage of their sin, that can save them. And Daniel saw God and knew that God could rescue him. But even if God didn't rescue Daniel, even if God didn't rescue Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, death would be better than bowing down to giving in to anything other than the full gospel of God. And I want to encourage you guys, be in Jesus. Be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. And when life comes at you, when the culture of our world today comes against you and says, what do you think about this topic? What do you think about this? Is this a sin? If you And they're trying to trap you. They're trying to say, hey, we want you to bend your gospel to make us feel better. We want you to bend your gospel to say that this isn't a sin. We want you to bend the gospel to say that our lifestyle is okay, that it's all right, that it's everything it needs to be. Guys, what will you do when that time comes? Because you may not be killed, but you may be persecuted by being canceled online, by being laughed at, by being pointed to, by being hated by the people around you. And we know that is coming because Jesus himself said that the world hated him. How much more is it going to hate us? We live in a world that is going to hate us. But guys, we serve a God who is bigger than the world. The Bible says that if our God is for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. The world can hate us. The world can strip us of our clothes. It can strip us of our Twitter accounts. It can do all of these hurtful things. It can make videos of us. It can do all of these things. And it can make us feel bad, but nothing, nothing. Let's look here. Actually, I don't know if I can quite remember uh, where it's at, but the Bible says that we are convinced that height, that nor depth, nor distance, nor nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. God showed his love for Daniel, that he saved Daniel in the midst of death. And God will show his love for you exactly how he shows it for you when the time comes. We may experience death. We may experience pain. We may experience being saved from all of those. And God is going to do it because God will be glorified. And so that's our message today, guys. Our message today is what would you do? Do you trust God to save you? And do you also trust God enough to know that the best is for you and for him, even if he doesn't save you? Do you trust God enough to allow yourself, your body, your family to be put on the line for the truth of the gospel? And, and I want you guys to know that Jesus loves you. He loves you, man. And he wants your full heart. He wants your full being. But coming to Jesus does mean dying to yourself. And that's easier said than done. But God wants you. He will strengthen and empower you when that time comes. But don't be swayed by the culture around us. Don't be swayed by the world around us. 
be only swayed by the truth and power of our Lord Jesus Christ and the full gospel, full truth of his word. All right. Thank you guys for listening. I love you guys. And uh, be looking for our podcast on uh, just later this week, probably on Wednesday or Tuesday. All right. Bye.